Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namaste so in the last few videos, we've been going over the different states of consciousness, Jagrat, Svapna, Sushupti, and now we come to Turiya. And Turiya is a mystery. It's, well, I'm going to have to quote from the Upanishads because it's very difficult to talk about Turiya. Turiya is the Atman. Turiya is Brahman. Turiya is the ground of being, the substrate of all consciousness and existence. In fact, it's the only real existence. <laughs> all other existence are simply illusions. And we'll explain that after we read from the Upanishad. Turiya is not that which is conscious of the internal, subjective world, nor that which is conscious of the external, objective world, nor that which is conscious of both, nor that which is a mass of all sentiency, nor that which is simple consciousness, nor that which is insentient. It is unseen by any sense organ, not related to anything, incomprehensible by the mind, uninferrable, unthinkable, indescribable, essentially of the nature of consciousness constituting the self alone, the negation of all phenomena, the peaceful, all bliss, and non-dual. This is what is known as the fourth, Turiya. This is the Atman, and it is to be realized. So this is reminiscent of the Buddha's explanation of Nibbana or Nirvana, that it is defined only in negative terms, that which it is not. And this is not strictly a Buddhist frame of reference. It's also there in the Upanishads, neti neti, not this, not this. Nothing which we can perceive is Turiya, for the simple reason that Turiya is the perceiver, is the, actually, not even the perceiver, the underlying awareness that, when it becomes manifest, becomes the perceiver. This is all very abstruse and esoteric, <laughs> and it has to be that way. Because Turiya, or Brahman, or Atman, is not of this world. Now, this world exists because Brahman exists. But it's not that Brahman creates it. I like to use the example of the wake of a boat. A boat is traveling through the water, and a wake is spreading out after it. But the aim of the boat, the purpose of the boat, is not to create the wake. <laughs> it's simply to travel in the water. So in the same way, because Brahman exists, the world exists. But it's not that Brahman intends to create the world or that Brahman takes action to create the world because Brahman is actionless. Brahman has no intentions, because intentions are based on desires, and all of Brahman's desires are constantly fulfilled. There's no such thing as Brahman having an unfulfilled desire. So what's the motivation to create the world or to do anything? There is none. Let me read what Shankaracharya says about Turiya in his introduction to this uh, mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad. 
A relation between the real and the unreal cannot be expressed by words, because such relation is itself non-existent. Turiya cannot be the object of any other instrument of knowledge, such as direct perception, because of its unique nature, owing to the absence of upadis. Atman cannot have anything like a generic property, like the cow, etc., because it is devoid of all upadis, or attributes. It has neither generic nor specific characteristics, because it is one without a second. It cannot be known by any activity proceeding from it, because it is devoid of all actions. It cannot be described by attributes such as blue, etc., because it is without any attribute. Therefore, it follows that Turiya cannot be indicated by any name. So then why do we call it Turiya? Well, the answer is that we are in duality. And in duality, due to the illusion of subject and object, it appears to us <laughs> that Turiya is a thing. Brahman is a thing. The Atman is a thing, an object that exists and that we can talk about. But actually, Brahman is known in the Upanishads as that from which words and the mind turn back, unable to achieve it. In other words, we can talk about our ideas about Brahman, but we can't talk about Brahman itself. We can't talk about Turiya directly. And the reason is that Turiya is the self of all, of everything. Brahman is in everything and everything is in Brahman, which is pure consciousness. By pure consciousness, I mean consciousness without an object. That's, I usually call it awareness, pure awareness. Consciousness has an object. There's consciousness, and then there's the object of consciousness, and then there's the act of perceiving through consciousness. So the so-called duality is actually a triplicity. The actor, the acted upon, or the object, and the action. So there are always three things. We've gone over that in earlier series on ontology and all that. But for the purpose of understanding Turiya, the only way we can realize Turiya is to meditate and realize it directly. There is no instrument such as uh, direct perception or knowledge that can help us because Brahman, Turiya, Atman is not the object of any action, including the act of perception. That's why Ramana Maharshi said, you cannot see Brahman, you can only be Brahman. And the Upanishads back this up. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And Tattvamasi, you are also Brahman. <laughs> so, in other words, <laughs> Turiya means pure subjectivity. And so even meditation cannot directly reveal Turiya or Brahman. It's hard to say actually how it's realized. Although I've given some techniques in this other series, The Secret Path to Moksha. One has to simply go in, go inside, and sit. And when one becomes fortunate, when one becomes pure, the secret is revealed. It's not easy, but it's very, very simple. In fact, it's so simple that <laughs> Our minds have a hard time dealing with it uh, because we're used to complicated things, things based on duality and triplicity. And so when something so simple as unitary Brahman 
is uh, the object of our inquiries. Well, it can't be an object. See, that's the problem. Brahman can only be a subject. It's only subjective. It's not objective. So it cannot be the object of consciousness or action or reasoning or inference or any instrument of knowledge. That's the problem. It's not like anything else we've ever dealt with. And yet we are Brahman. We deal with it all the time. It is our very self, Atman. Not only myself, it's yourself and the self in the animals and birds and even in inanimate objects. Brahman is everywhere and in everything. And everything is in Brahman at the same time. See, the mind can't handle this. <laughs> it goes in the category of that's just the way it is. <laughs> and it is beautiful. Once you realize it, then all sufferings are done, finished, gone, done away with. Huh? I mean, yeah, the body and the senses and the mind may still experience various discomforts and inconveniences and so on. Because the prarabdha karma of this life, this body, continues to exist even after realization. But one is absolutely certain that I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am not these senses. I am not of this world at all. This world is simply something that's happening as an epiphenomenon of the existence of Brahman. And there is no, from the, the point of view of Brahman, there is no coming into existence of the world. In other words, no creation. See, creation is something that happens in duality. And Brahman is not in duality. Never in duality. Even though the creation happens within Brahman. Well, because everything happens within Brahman. There is only Brahman. Brahman is the only real existence. So everything, whatever there is and whatever happens, happens within Brahman. So uh, it's very difficult to talk about. But it's easy to realize once you have this key. And the key is that everything is consciousness. Everything that we see, hear, smell, taste, feel, and touch, or even think about, is actually Brahman. Now, if we can meditate on this, just meditate on it, just contemplate it. It may take a long time, but eventually something will flip inside and you'll get it. And so far, several of my students have got it. I'm very pleased to hear that they are ecstatic <laughs> and they're very pleased with the result. And I have to also mention the case of my Asanyas Guru. Uh, when he died, when he left his body, he was not suffering at all. I asked him only two or three days before his death, is there any pain? He says, no, no pain. And he was always in meditation. He was always detached. You see, this is a realized soul, a realized being, a Jivan Mukta. A Jivan Mukta remains lucid until the very end, the last two or three days of the body. And their death is painless. There's no suffering. They simply withdraw from this world. And that is the destination of anyone who attains the highest enlightenment. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. 
Aung Namah Shivaya.